Greetings, this is a supplement to the online course Self-Determination in the Post-Colonial World. It's a set of method notes for political economic analysis. And I suggest that you try these six segments slowly. They are all short segments, all in one um, recording here, but try them slowly one at a time because they're meant to be integrated with the material of the Self-Determination in the Post-Colonial World course. So, in section one, I want to talk about knowing and learning, some basics about how we know things and how we endeavour to find out how to know things here. So here's a couple of concepts to distinguish. Ontology means the study of reality or existence, how we conceive of the universe. And then following from that, we have epistemology, which means the study of knowledge, how do humans know things. And epistemologies are often linked to a method of finding out the study of a process of obtaining knowledge. So, for example, in epistemologies, we've got idealism, which is associated with self-exploration, philosophy and logic, for example. Empiricism in the Western tradition, which was to do with the early days of scientific experiments. And it's often associated with methodological approaches such as positivism, objectivism, scientific observation. And then in the social sciences, we have constructivism or interpretivism, that is to say it's combining ideas with evidence. It's an argumentative form which is very common in social sciences. Uh, Europe's Kantian synthesis which tried to resolve idealism and empiricism is said to be able to gather the elements for cognition, unite them to form a certain content. So it's about ideas with evidence and uh, that uh, I'll come to in a moment. Just to go over idealism, Idealism has been linked in the Western tradition to Plato's theory of forms, that is to say that intangible forms or ideas are considered more real than the changing physical world. For example, he said we can't see justice or beauty, but they're very real concepts to us. And similarly, I guess in religion with textual authority, truth is said to be found in scripture or sacred texts. It has less to do with actual uh, correlation with the independent objects of the physical world. Pure logic also in mathematics, for example, other forms of logical reasoning are idealistic in their approach, basically. Um, the study of matters which don't depend on changing circumstances. The problems are that dogma in this sort of territory is often confronted with inconvenient experience. Uh, for example, the, the clash, famous clash between Galileo and the Church of Rome about the earth moving around the sun rather than vice versa. In the so-called Enlightenment period in Europe, we have this rise of empiricism, that is to say, a rejection of those old dogmas and an attempt to uh, define reality by what we observe with the five senses, with hearing, seeing, tasting and smelling and so on. So empiricist epistemology uh, with a positivist method, for example, the idea that you can identify positive realities out there independent of our uh, perceptions. The idea that knowledge is objective, can be built on incrementally, um, for example, through particular scientific observations in medicine or astronomy that uh, people work together and add little bits to an overall body of knowledge. This is a type of positivist method associated with empiricism. And it applies to those areas where hypotheses or theories about um, reality can be tested in situations where there are not many additional factors to those under study. So we can isolate the dependent, the so-called dependent and independent variables. The problems with that is that new factors can arise, new variables can be arise, or they can be detected and force a reassessment of the framework of ideas behind that hypothesis. Nevertheless, empiricism and rationalism are these two currents in the Western tradition positivist method I mentioned there before, adding to a body of knowledge. It's still used quite a lot these days. It's used particularly in the physical and medical sciences, but it has less credence in the social sciences where there are so many uncontrolled and uncontrollable variables. For example, in medical science, uh, it may be that a virus can be studied as to the structure of its DNA code, even its infectious capacity amongst humans, its likelihood of causing illness and death. But the social responses to war, for example, might depend upon the motives of elites, the impact of misinformation, unity or disunity amongst those under attack, the capacity and alliances of those under attack and other variables. So it's quite typical that in the social sciences, we have a lot of these other variables which are difficult and make theorizing more difficult. 
So searches for social meaning often require reconceptualization and maybe even a new paradigm, that is to say, a new conceptual overview of the phenomena we're looking at. The most common epistemology in Western social sciences has been constructivism. So it flows from, or it's linked to this Kantian synthesis idea, which brings together conceptual knowledge and the application of evidence, um, bringing them together and constructing an argument, constructing an argument about what reality is in a particular area. And so those sort of arguments are used to argue more general propositions or the evidence of particular experiences are generalized to argue these general propositions. Constructivism in its traditions also implies some active engagement in the learning process. So the, the theorists or the analysts, those who are conceptualizing social science or political economic problems are meant to actively engage and construct new ways of looking at the problem. In reading more complex social variables, which can't be easily, easily isolated, there's more often a need to reconceptualize the problem. But the problem is that in socio-political economic theory, um, it's a fragile territory, it's a contested area, and theories can break down even when they are quite specific theories as opposed to mega theories, you know, mega theories about how um, societies operate or modern societies or capitalist societies operate. And many of those mega theories, it's really impossible to prove them right or wrong. There's always arguments to try and keep them alive. But if we look at a, a more specific theory, for example, the economic theory of currency value, which used to be said that the value of a currency was said to be determined by the demand for dollar denominated assets. It means dollar in this sense means the particular currency of a particular country the DDDA, the demand for dollar denominated assets, was going to reflect on what were called the fundamentals of an economy. That is to say, its exports and its foreign investment. So what was happening on foreign exchange was linked to the real things in the real economy. Now, the problem is that from the 1970s onward, we saw currencies traded for other reasons than for foreign investment or trade, such as hedging and speculation. Um, also, um, you know, just trading in currencies for because of the volatility there to make money on those ups and downs, for example, that dollar denominated assets theory broke down. So I think that illustrates well the problem of complex new social variables, even in these relatively technical areas. So the general lesson from that, I think, is that social, political and economic theory is often less definitive and more contested than that of the physical sciences. Let's come to the second section, concepts, theory, and evidence. Now, in common constructivist approaches or arguments in the social sciences, we do need to conceptualize. Why to draw some more general knowledge out of particular experiences? If we're only talking of particular experiences, we're not really able to convey knowledge that's meaningful to other people. So the abstractions of conceptualizing a problem allow us to suggest general knowledge from a particular experience. For example, people who read a lot are generally more thoughtful. That's a theory. It could be tested, perhaps. Um, theory is a body of concepts, or it's bringing together some concepts into a coherent system. Um, so, for example, most versions of liberalism try to universalize notions of individualism and individual freedom, for example. And then in the constructivist approach, we have the importance of evidence alongside this conceptualization. Evidence grounds ideas, and when it can be reproduced, it helps communicate knowledge. Because if someone else can test out our ideas by uh, an experiment where they come up with the same results, then it tends to confirm the sort of knowledge we're trying to convey. So in this circumstance, I want to draw your attention to the fact that it is necessary to conceptualize in political economy, in the social sciences, it's not necessarily necessary to use theory or larger bodies of conceptualization, but it is necessary to conceptualize to try and extract some useful knowledge, general knowledge. Systematic evidence allows our conceptual arguments to advance. Um, and what do I mean by this? Let, here's an example. In foreign aid, for example, it's been shown that despite bilateral aid programs in health, evidence shows, and this is large systematic evidence that was um, studied by some researchers uh, commissioned by the IMF, 
health indicators in particular countries remain poor. Now, if that's simply said that the aid programs are not having an effect on health, people could speculate that this was due to local factors, corruption, they can blame their favourite villain in, in, the, in the piece or whatever. But when we have this more systematic evidence across many, many countries, uh, for example, these two IMF Commission studies uh, in 2005, 2007, finding that bilateral aid did not reduce infant mortality at all, and infant mortality is a very useful indicator of a health system, a country applying its resources in, in health to um, the general population. Um, there's something wrong in a lot of different contexts, not just in one context. Now, a later IMF study confirmed that only doubling health aid was associated with a 2% reduction in infant mortality, and that was very small compared to the then Millennium Development Goals. And it suggests systematic bilateral aid failures rather than particular problems in a particular country. So this helps illustrate, I think, that systematic evidence does help us in better perspectives on the systematic questions we're looking at. Here's some practical advice at the beginning in writing essays, in writing theses, in a model, if you like, or um, a, um, uh, an audition for writing longer works, independent works. First of all, questions are better posed as questions rather than conclusions at the beginning. In other words, stylistically, it's rather good to defer judgment at the beginning until we've demonstrated some study of the ideas and the evidence. If we set up a question to address, which is usually required in a thesis, for example, we should avoid rapid, rapid preemptive judgments and leave open the possibility that there is something to learn from the research, the possibility of surprise, as some have said. In that sense, uh, in writing a thesis uh, or, you know, a, pr a practice book, in other words, conclusions are usually much less important than the pro process by which we arrive at them. Conceptualise the problem, I, I mentioned why that's important, trying to identify common themes behind particular experiences so that the stories have greater meaning. We shouldn't make the mistake, of course, of assuming that a case study proves a general point, and that's why we shouldn't let stories drive our essay. We see journalists doing it a lot, but it's not good analysis. Careful study of wider evidence is required for that. A story can illustrate a broader social reality, but it can't demonstrate it or prove it. Um, thirdly, we should state our approach, our method in some way. It need only be simple. Uh, stating at the outset might be only a sentence or two. Just say what sort of ideas you're going to use and what sort of evidence you're going to use. And stating that approach, even briefly, can help us reflect about what our task is in constructing an argument. Fourthly, we have to use evidence in a constructivist approach. The study of society necessarily involves some reference to actual social experience, unless we're just philosophizing or engaged in some religious assertions, basically. We have to link those ideas to social experience. So always try and use some social experience, even if it's only illustrative, to demonstrate arguments. Better to use systematic evidence, wide-scale evidence, um, like surveys, censuses, or other systematic forms of evidence, but some sort of evidence at least. And finally, justify the argument. It's not enough in an essay or a thesis to just say, that sounds good to me. We have to explain and address alternative arguments because these things are really also exercises in communication. We have to communicate what we're thinking, not just make ourselves feel good about it. Some bad habits, some individualism, which are common in everyday life, but as analysts, we don't want to indulge in them. Those who say, I told you so, I predicted this, mark my words, they're generally just branding themselves as childish egotists, not analysts. Analysts engage in a process of reason and evidence where they learn the craft of transparent explanation, that is to say, showing how other people can come to the same conclusions, not setting themselves up as authority figures who know all and are passing on their knowledge to other people. Similarly, we should avoid turning suspicions into knowledge. There are many things that make us suspect certain uh, outcomes, but we can't really simply turn out, uh, equate suspicions with knowledge. A suspicion requires maybe a little bit of evidence, but to assert something positively requires a lot more evidence, and confusing those two just expose immaturity or prejudice. Finally, here's a little summary to 
uh, which links into constructivist method. We should be applying reason and evidence. In a controversy, for example, which this course uh, deals with quite a bit, we should consider all sides. We can't exclude anything. We can't say here's a reliable source and we'll ignore A, B and C. Uh, no serious analyst really excludes any form of potential evidence or even uh, a, a line of argument, a line of reasoning, for example. We should, however, identify interests and see to what extent self-interest may distort particular versions. We should look for relatively independent evidence if it exists. We should apply relevant principles. These things are not devoid of principles. For example, in controversies, in international controversies, the principle of non-intervention, which is violated a lot, in the post-colonial world, despite the consensus around the right of a people to self-determination. And we should avoid selective or personalized analysis, in quotes, anecdotes that can illustrate but not demonstrate or prove social realities. These things are used a lot in journalism, you know, start off with a story and then try and make the story define a social reality. That doesn't do it in social analysis. We can only illustrate realities that we are trying to argue for or demonstrate with wider evidence there. Okay, section three on sources and ideologies. Now here I'm coming back to sources and I'm going to go through in a few sections. First of all, I want to explain a bit about why we use primary, diverse and independent sources in the academic tradition, as opposed to the secondary and reliable sources that Wikipedia and some journalism uses. Um, secondly, I want to discount the idea that we should read only reliable or familiar sources, because while that seems convenient, it is superficial and creates source dependence. An intelligent reading of diverse sources is the foundation of better understandings. We learn less if we only read reliable or familiar sources. Um, thirdly, uh, I want to go through the lessons, and I'll mention this a little bit later on too, the lessons we can gain from reading unreliable, partisan or hostile sources. This is important because journalists will always try and discount this, Wikipedia will try and discount it. Unreliable or partisan sources, or even let's say enemy sources, they can provide us with unfamiliar detail and perspectives. They can provide us, importantly, with admissions against interest that can help resolve controversies very quickly. They can provide us with material which help inform our critiques. And reading partisan sources requires distinguishing headline spin from useful detail. So we have to be able to dive into it if the source is simply presenting conclusions or as I call it headline spin, there's not much there, but a detailed explanation with some evidence from a, uh, an unreliable or a partisan source can be useful. We can read other things into it. And finally, if people have little time to read um, and they, they don't have the time to pursue these different sources, they should choose sources which themselves explain diverse perspectives, that is not simple partisanship. Okay, here's the the basic explanation of primary, diverse, independent sources per the academic conventions, which tell, people, tell students at university, never use Wikipedia. I'm not going to say don't read Wikipedia. I'm going to say learn how we should use it and not use it. Here is why academics say primary sources are important. What are they? They're close as, as, so, as close to the source, uh, sources as close, to, they are evidence as close to the source as possible. Uh, so the key element of academic research allows research to go on behind the interpretations of others. For example, if someone cites an interview, it may be difficult for us to go and redo that interview. But if we redo that interview, we are closer to the source. If someone cites another text, we can always go back to that other text and then we avoid the possibility that someone has cited it in a partisan way or in a way that only shows certain aspects of that original text. So we should always go back to the original text. And that enables us to take responsibility for our use of theory and evidence. We can't really hide behind other sources in that way. Um, so that's different to the Wikipedia approach, which says we are only using secondary sources, reliable you know, media such as the New York Times and the Washington Post and so on. And that buries the, the spin that's already embedded in the, in the narrative at that stage. Diverse sources in a controversy in particular, it's better to see the, diverse, the different sides, including possible areas of agreement. If there is agreement across opposing sides or opposing interests, it starts to reinforce in us that there may be some common ground where we can say there is agreement on these sorts of things and we look for the areas of disagreement. And finally, independent sources. 
independent sources or relatively independent sources can help us resolve controversies. I'll give some examples of this later on. But that also requires recognizing interest. You know, who has an interest in what they're talking about? And that's the key to identifying independence. And that sometimes requires detailed knowledge of a particular controversy. For example, World War I, I've given this little illustration here of some of the different national parties involved in World War I. It did involve a web of competing empires and independent peoples. And we have to, as human beings, we want general knowledge about what that war was all about. We have to look for it in overarching perspectives. In this case, for example, one of them, one of the more convincing ones is it was about the competition between empires and the breakdown of some empires and the rise of others. So otherwise, it's a history with lots of detail, which doesn't appear to have particular meaning. And it recurs all over again when similar sorts of things happen in, in subsequent wars. Okay, weaponized ideologies. Uh, the human rights battlefield is something in particular in the 21st century. We should always be aware of high sounding rationales for intervention and war. Aggressors have almost always disguised their crimes with good intentions or high sounding rationales. And so it is with the use of human rights claims these days, because human rights as a concept have gained so much credibility uh, in the contemporary world in the last couple of generations, they are used by everyone against their favorite target. So we should always measure stated aims and objectives of those who are using human rights as a, a tool in political debate against their interests and their actions, particularly when high aims are used as a pretext for intervention or war, which in principle is prohibited under the principles of international law these days. That means we have to uh, develop an ability to identify interest, claims made with self-interest and sources linked to interested parties. For example, a lot of states fund bodies, uh, so-called NGOs these days, or are very closely associated with other bodies which don't appear to be state parties. And we have to be able to work our way through that to identify interest. Well, here's an example um, of the during the war on Syria, how a German survey group um, contracted by US funded anti Syria group, the Syria campaign based in the US, released a headline and summary that wasn't supported by the detail of its own survey. But Western media, for example, Deutsche Welle, um, mostly repeated the headline because it suited them. Now, in this case, there was a couple of fallacies here. One was um, using the headline and not reading the detail. And the other one was not seeing what the actual was, who was backing, who was funding this anti-Syria group, the Syria campaign. The story was, as you see in the center there, um, or the accusation was 70% of refugees are fleeing Assad from the Syria campaign by a, a German survey group. Um, but this was not what the survey said. In the survey, there was no question even asked about fleeing Assad, as the, as the press release and the headline said. It is true that 70% had answered that the Syrian army was responsible for the fighting, but in that multiple option question, 74% also chose anti-government armed groups. 77% said they feared arrest by the Syrian army, but 82% also selected anti-government armed groups. That is to say, more feared, feared the, the anti-government fighters than the Syrian army. So that was the first level of misrepresentation or discord between the headline and the actual survey, which as we know was um, funded by a belligerent party. Secondly, the poll was grossly under, under, unrepresentative of Syrian refugees. It was 68% young men 74% had come from jihadist held areas, that is to say the, the, um, the, the anti-government fighters. There were almost no women or children in the survey. Hardly anyone from the government held areas of Tartus, Latakia, Sweda, and very few from Damascus, for example. So this was a very unrepresentative and poll and it was wrongly reported. So the conclusion from that is we have to read the detail, uh, particularly in headlines, um, go beyond the headlines, read the detail, read the questions and the answers, check also for a sampling method and error. Now there wasn't a sampling method, there wasn't a plus or minus figure there, it wasn't really a properly conducted representative poll. They didn't explain how they were choosing those people, but they did fortunately uh, note 
that 68% were young men, three quarters were from the anti-government held areas and so on. So that's why we have to look a little bit more carefully at these sorts of polls in huge controversies. Here's another example, and it also goes to the humanitarian war story, and it has to do with Amnesty International. Now, Amnesty International, which began in the 1960s as a letter writing group and whatever else we want to say about the origins of that group, they were known for supporting prisoners of conscience. They said they were apolitical, they were against all violence and so on. But somewhere that changed, and we see that with the first Gulf War in 1990-91, Amnesty International backed the Nurse Nayira story, the fake incubator babies story, which was used to support that war. The background to this is that there was a reluctant US populace to support uh, an invasion of Kuwait uh, and Iraq after the Iraqi government under Saddam Hussein had invaded Kuwait. And so this young woman was used to uh, claim in public on television that she had witnessed as a nurse um, Iraqi troops going to Kuwait, pulling the babies out, throwing them onto the cold floor and stealing the incubators. And that inflamed public opinion to the point where the president then, George H. Bush, got sufficient public support to invade, expel uh, Iraq from Kuwait and then slaughter a lot of Iraqi troops on the way back into Iraq. But it turned out that young woman was the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador in the US and the entire story was fabricated. Amnesty International backed that story and only after the war did they say, oh, you know, we didn't have any additional evidence to say that it was true. A very serious breach of their so-called independence. A few years later on, on the 10th anniversary of the invasion of Afghanistan, the US State Department official Susan Nossel became head of Amnesty International in the US. Notice the conflict of interest there that um, there is a state official passing to this so-called independent NGO. And then Amnesty immediately began praising the NATO occupation of Afghanistan with billboards at a NATO um, meeting. I think it was in Chicago at that time, 2012, uh, saying NATO keep the progress going. In other words, here was a supposedly independent human rights group um, praising a NATO, a foreign body, which had nothing to do with the Middle East. It was meant to be about North Atlantic security occupying Afghanistan for 10 years and praising that occupation. Another, a serious conflict of interest, a serious deviation from the supposed ideals of Amnesty International. And the other illustration I have here is Amnesty backed several false stories about Libya, which in which NATO also intervened in 2011. They claimed, in this case, the French branch of Amnesty, that Gaddafi was using black mercenaries to massacre civilians. And there were some other um, uh, details like uh, supposedly he was using Viagra so that the troops would rape civilians and so on. Well, after NATO bombed and destroyed Libya, Amnesty in France admitted those stories were false. So what's the conclusion from this? We have to be wary of emotional pleas surrounding interventionist war, even if they appear to come from independent NGOs, which it turns out are not so independent. Subject all war claims to a careful scrutiny and have regard to the history of the advocacy for war, especially conflicts of interest. Okay, on to section four, systematic versus anecdotal evidence. I've mentioned this already, but in a little bit more detail. In social analysis, Systematic evidence is always preferable to anecdotal evidence, which can only illustrate and not represent or prove social realities. Nevertheless, liberal culture, journalistic practice often elevates individual experience, including the fallacy that oh, I was there, so therefore I can tell the truth. That idea gives wider validity to particular experience. No, it doesn't. Being there doesn't guarantee that someone is really has a well-informed perspective and is preferable to someone else who was there, for example. Thirdly, systematic social evidence can be found in censuses or total accounts of things, in representative surveys, but not bias surveys, in other accounts of systematic study. Okay, here's one of the famous examples of this in terms of surveys. This was the competition between um, political polls or voting voter um, predisposition polls for the 1936 election in the USA. It was a big contest between the Literary Digest, which was a very big magazine of the time and the polls set up by George Gallup. 
And this showed that big polls could be very wrong and showed some of the principles involved in representative polls. So the Literary Digest poll had picked the winner in every US presidential election for the previous 20 years, and it had thousands of staff, sometimes as many as 20 million people were surveyed, which was a, a very large proportion of the, the US population at that time. Ballots were mailed to names polled from automobile registration lists and telephone directories. Can you spot the bias here in 1936? Uh, by no means everyone in the US had an automobile. By no means everyone had a telephone at that time. The prevailing assumption was the more you interview, the closer you get to the view of the whole population or the truth about what people are thinking. This is not the case at all. And um, we know it these days, particularly from this experience. So in 1935, with their particular selection process, uh, George Gallup's group interviewed 3,000 people compared to the Literary Digest's 10 million. The Literary Digest predicted a Roosevelt loss with 43%, and Gallup predicted a Roosevelt win with 54%. Well, it turned out Roosevelt won with 61%, and soon after that, the Literary Digest went out of business. Now, can you spot the Digest source of bias? It was because it was the better... Uh, healed people, the people with more income that had cars and telephones at that time. And so they excluded a very large percentage of the population. It was a skewed um, sample, even though the sample was very big. Whereas the Gallup poll, although it wasn't that close to the outcome, was much closer than the Literary Digest poll with a much smaller sample, but a sample which was chosen <clears throat> in a much more random way, which came to be the main basis on which such polls are run. There are other ways of uh, selection in polls, but the randomness is one of the key ones. Here's another example about the, the substitution of systematic with anecdotal evidence, the COVID skeptic trap, I call it. In 2020, with the pandemic of COVID-19, for example, um, there was huge controversy about how dangerous this disease was and a huge debate about it. And of course, that debate influenced the, the measures that were used to try and contain the spread of the, the virus and the, the damage and the deaths from the virus. Well, first of all, we have to state the obvious that systematic epidemiological evidence, particularly when it's new, always has problems. But epidemiologists always begin with official data, which that is to say is state data, which collects as much as it can from the entire nation, and then try and account for the errors in those estimates. So in the 2020 pandemic, COVID deaths were collated across more than 200 countries. So the general prevalence of it was made, uh, or the, the reporting of general prevalence made systematic bias far less likely because really it was about many, many countries doing this in different ways. Nevertheless, many COVID skeptics and conspiracists seizing on criticisms of official death data rejected all the official data and substituted anecdotal or individual accounts. Now that's a very bad error. We should never substitute uh, even imperfect systematic evidence with anecdotal evidence. We will never get there in terms of defining a social reality from anecdotal evidence. And of course, while there were reasons to think that there might've been an overcounting of COVID deaths, there were also reasons to think why there might've been an undercounting of it. And there's been articles written you know, on both sides in that way. So here, much the same logic applies to other forms of official data, for example, electoral participation, when people question to what extent people were turning out to vote or voting or why they were not turning out to vote and so on. We should always start with the systematic evidence and work back from there, not substitute systematic evidence with anecdotal or individual accounts. Here's another example, and this is sets up a systematic practice to analyze one particular phenomenon. This is the, an example about food security in Venezuela. This is over 2015, 2016, when the US government and US uh, uh, media monopolies, let's say, like the New York Times, for example, were reporting that there was a food crisis in Venezuela and that this was all the failure of the socialist government under Nicolas Maduro and therefore Venezuela was a failure and a dictatorship and, and so on and so on. Now, uh, there was a huge controversy here and there was a way to read through it, but it needed a little discipline. Now, here, I've given four steps here. First of all, we need to observe the reports of a social drama. Um, here's some sources, the New York Times, 
Breitbart, the Daily Beast, the UK Telegraph, all saying that people are starving in Venezuela. 15% of people eat garbage to survive. Venezuela has become a starvation state. Notice the interests and the limitation of these sources, particularly as regards power and language. These are uh, US and British sources, the government of which is very hostile to the government of Venezuela at that time for their own reasons. Notice the ideological conflict behind these stories. Ever since the uh, Hugo Chavez became president in 1999, there's been a strong political conflict between the leading uh, capitalist countries, UK and the US and Venezuela. So we have to have regard to this social drama here. Next, let's check the proverbial other side. Now, this used to be a, a common liberal principle to look at the other side if, if there's a, a two-sided polemic, for example. In this case, government reports. We often have, though, um, a very illiberal uh, suggestion from the media, for example, that we can't look at you know, the state media from other governments. No, no, we have to look at the other side. The Venezuelan government said at that time that food shortages were caused by politicized commercial hoarders and that the government was addressing the problem through social programs such as school feeding. There was no general food crisis and there's a couple of sources on that. In the third step, we can check for independent evidence to see is there any uh, evidence that seems to be reported which is uh, not aligned to those two sides. And in this case we have, although it's it's mainly in Spanish, but to some extent in English here, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations uh, in these three headlines has recognized Venezuela's work for um, in food security, that they have dismissed false statements over Venezuela. This is from mid-2016 that they've recognized Venezuela was recognized for halving malnutrition that was earlier in 2015. Now we have to check the, the dates of these reports to see that we're, uh, we're comparing apples and apples because there was a bit of a process over 2015, 2016. If we go through it in a systematic way, then we can work backwards to the source to see whether that independent evidence was cited correctly. So in this case, we can go back to the FAO, we can go back to Chinese reports of the FAO because the Chinese are relatively independent in this sort of situation. If we go back to the original sources, once again, using that principle of as primary sources as possible, we can uh, verify that the FAO, an independent source, said that what was being stated in the US media was not accurate. So that I suggest this shows us um, an example of how we should approach political economic controversies in a systematic way and not just rely on particular headlines or particular anecdotal or individual sources. Okay, section five, principles in critical reading. Uh, that is to say, recognizing principles as part of our analysis. Uh, researchers, particularly Western researchers, can't simply dismiss all biased, unreliable enemy sources because, as I've said before, they may provide insights, especially admissions against interest, like a confession in a criminal case. But we should be cautious of the likely self-serving character of biased sources, which impute bad behavior to their opponents and decent behavior to themselves. Here again are several reasons why we can get useful lessons from biased or even enemy sources. There may be the missions of their own crimes, which are very valuable to resolve arguments. They may recognize accepted facts. That is to say, if both sides in a, in a controversy accept things, we can, we can use that for citation. In other words, it's better to use a, a, a source which is against, uh, to prove a controversial fact by saying it's been admitted or acknowledged by uh, a source against its interest. They can alert us to distinct claims or lines of reasoning that we may not have considered before. And we should recognize in principle that even our worst enemy might sometimes say something correct. If we don't really understand that, we should go back to school and, and think again about how we're assessing these sorts of things. But that, of course, means that values are required and a method is required to sort the wheat from the chaff. And what we have, unfortunately, in a lot of Western traditions is to sometimes say, we'll throw out everything. Critical reading means we dismiss everything that's in the corporate media, for example. Because there's lots of lies in the corporate media, we can't accept anything. No, we have to learn how to read it critically with some principles and avoid these sort of extreme caricatures where 
opponents are fascists or little Hitlers and so on. But there's a lot of that sort of abuse in Western critical thinking, unfortunately. So I'm saying that social and ethical values have to underpin critical analysis. In the absence of those strong values, a lot of Western criticism simply adopts, consciously or unconsciously, liberal individualistic values. We have to recognize that a bias source might sometimes be right. And we should be ready to accept that someone who we consider an opponent or an enemy in other ways might be right on certain things. Further, and notwithstanding the fact that public interest is often cited to back private agendas, every society has some sort of decent social structures, for example, public health systems, which have been created by popular demand. So social and ethical values combined with an honest and systematic critical exploration involving reason and evidence are necessary to disentangle controversies. And I've said this before, but there's no such thing as always reliable sources nor inadmissible sources, sources that are banned. Evidence from opposing sources are often best to resolve controversies, best to cite, because then we get past the need to argue these things endlessly. As in law, those sort of admissions must be distinguished from self-serving statements. And here's a little quote at the bottom right there about legal principles um, in court cases that admissions may be given in evidence against people, but self-serving declarations are generally not admissible. So we have to learn how to read bias, not simply avoid it. Here's a good example of the use of admissions. Now, in this case, the admissions are US officials, senior US officials, and in one case, UK officials, uh, admitting that their close allies had funded all of the terrorist groups in Syria. Now, the, in other words, these were partial admissions because the US was not admitting that they themselves funded the terrorist groups, but in admitting that their closest allies were doing it, we can infer that this means that they supported it because of course the US does not provide weapons or support to their closest allies to do something that's fundamentally against their interests. So here, senior US and UK officials admitted their major allies had funded uh, United Nations Security Council banned terrorist groups, ISIS or Daesh and Jabhat al-Nusra, groups which have created pretexts for the direct interventions of the US and their allies. Now, those admissions are very valuable because they avert the need for extensive debate and evidence. But we've got to look at the spin in those admissions. So here, for example, the then head of the US Army, Martin Dempsey, said, I know major Arab allies who fund ISIL or ISIS. And in response, uh, the head of a Senate committee, Lindsey Graham, Senator Lindsey Graham said, yeah, but do they embrace them? They fund them because the Free Syrian Army couldn't fight Assad. They were trying to beat Assad. So he is reinforcing the admission. Former Vice President Joe Biden, then later president, admitted in 2014 also the Turks, the Saudis, the Emiratis sent thousands of tons of weapons into anyone who would fight against Assad, including al-Nusra and al-Qaeda, and this outfit called ISIL or ISIS. And similarly, a British general, former British general, Jonathan Shaw, said uh, that Wahhabi Salafism was igniting under the world, really, and is funded by Saudi and Qatari money. Of course, Saudi and the Qatari regime were those who were funding these terrorist groups in Syria. So this is why um, opposing sources, bias sources, can be useful, because in this case, the bias sources uh, you know, the US officials themselves who are directly involved in these conflicts, uh, the conflict in Syria in particular, um, are useful to cite because it helps resolve the controversy that they are, had nothing to do with ISIS and al-Nusra and they were enemies that they were targeting. Here's another example from Palestine and it has to do with the uh, one of the Israeli massacres of civilians in Palestine this one in 2014. Um, here we're using diverse sources, but independent evidence and admissions from bias sources allow us to form a better view. And the context is that really uh, it, the, the Israeli incursions into Gaza on several occasions have been presented as a conflict, a Palestinian-Israeli conflict, uh, sometimes even saying that the Israeli military was engaged in precision attacks and that the Palestinian resistance by firing rockets was were indiscriminate, or alternatively that there was a you know a plague on both sides. There was a moral equivalence in this conflict. Now, um, what I'm saying here is we have to uh, 
again, identify independent evidence and be wary of those moral equivalent claims which are, carry their own inbuilt assumptions. In this case, in terms of the scale of the conflict, we see that the deaths caused by the Israeli military side on the left there were far, far greater than the deaths caused by the Palestinian resistance. And by the way, the data here is um, early contemporaneous conflict because contemporaneous uh, sources, but later on it was said that up to 2,300 Palestinians were killed. In when this uh, graphic was compiled, it was over a thousand uh, deaths and 51 deaths in Israel. So in this case, with the deaths of Palestinian casualties, the UN, a relatively independent source at this stage, said that three fourths, 75 percent of the Palestinians killed in more than two weeks of Israel Hamas fighting, they're calling it, were civilians. Three quarters were civilians. Whereas um, the Israeli sources said themselves, in other words, there was an admission against interest if their interest was to downplay the uh, downplay the the their own indiscriminate use of violence and upplay the Palestinian attacks on civilians. The Israeli sources themselves said that um, there were 48 Israeli army IDF casualties and only three civilians had been killed. Yet the European Union condemned what they call the indiscriminate firing of rockets into Israel by Hamas and militant groups in the Gaza Strip directly harming civilians. The then Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon said, quote, Hamas rockets have randomly struck Israel. The New York Times, quote, said Hamas is committing a war crime by firing rockets indiscriminately. If we look at the data from relatively independent sources and admissions, we see that the the Palestinian resistance, the violence was relatively discriminate, only 6% civilian casualties, whereas over 75% civilian casualties on the Israeli side. So that's to do with the scale and the what you might call the collateral damage of the, um, the so-called moral equivalence. But then we've also got to consider the other aspects of moral equivalence, that is to say, the Palestinians were defending themselves from an incursion by a foreign military. Okay, section six, the last section on Wikipedia, social media and fact checkers. Now I've mentioned Wikipedia before, but its method explicitly rejects original research and primary sources and instead relies on what they say yeah, what they what they quote as reliable published secondary sources. In other words, pre-digested and anonymous information. They specifically reject original analysis, uh, points of view, in other words, opinion, but also original research. So this reflects a hegemonic authoritative consensus, typically a compilation of Anglo-American corporate and state media. In other words, the reliable sources are endorsed in practice in the, the process of compiling Wikipedia uh, entries as those that come from things their super editors regard as reliable, the New York Times, Washington Post, the, the BBC and so on. And then they will exclude those they consider unreliable, you know, the, the state media of Cuba and Syria and Iran and so on and so on. So that's a consensus which is enforced by super editors, those that can mediate uh, the contributions of other ordinary editors who can go in. It appears to be a participatory medium. Um, by contrast, I've said this before, academic method typically stresses more primary sources, diverse sources and independent inquiry. Now, does this mean we shouldn't read Wikipedia? No, it's quite good for trivia and technical detail, but it's likely to be misleading in a serious controversy. Even in science, it can be misleading. We should recognize its structural bias and never cite it in any controversy, debate or academic writing. That's what universities will tell you correctly. Um, it doesn't mean you shouldn't read it, but you have to be aware what you're reading. It is another bias source. In a sense, it's a compilation of a authoritative consensus from the English language version of the British and North American media, basically. Now, another thing to be aware of that the use of Google, which is, you know, ubiquitous in terms of search engines, and there are other search engines now, but Google is the best established and now a huge corporation with its own massive economy and its own interests, a massive US-based conglomerate, which owns many other companies. 
but there is a strong link between Google and Wikipedia. And if we go to search on Google, most often we will find there's a Wikipedia answer to the question very early in the entry. So we're not going to go through to page six or seven of the lists of, of entries there. That means that the researcher has to get, whether you're using Google or not, you have to get much more specific in your questions to find other sources. Because if you look for Iran, for example, you will find in the first few pages of Google, the US or UK sources on Iran and not the Iranian sources on Iran, unless you specify it now. So the problem here is that we are put on a railroad. But if we go to Google, it will send us to Wikipedia and we've got the problems of both of them. So Google as a huge US-based conglomerate creating its own hierarchy of sources and how it presents answers to us in a search. And then Wikipedia, an apparently participatory online encyclopedia, which is also US-based and controlled by an inner group of super editors, usually US and British, captured on major issues by powerful lobbies because a powerful lobby will go in and sanitize entries on things of interest to them. They will have the resources to do that and it'll be anonymous. We won't know who's editing it. And so the idea of responsibility for publishing something as usually exists in academic publishing disappears. And that reflects a truth as presented by the Western corporate media typically. So as I said before, it might be good for technical information, but hopeless on controversies. Now there's a source to an article by Mark Moran pointing out the 10 reasons why students can't rely on Wikipedia. Here's a, another example to show the problems with the Wikipedia and when, particularly when it comes to controversial social issues. Wikipedia's got its own page on the reliability of Wikipedia. And by the way, if you want to study Wikipedia by use of Google or most search engines, you will keep coming back to Wikipedia to study Wikipedia itself, which is a, an endless sort of loop. It's difficult to find independent sources on Wikipedia. But they begin themselves with the acknowledgement that 77% of all articles, more than three quarters of all articles are written by 1% of its editors the majority of whom are anonymous. So that tells you that people are not taking responsibility or they are hiding the names of the people who are providing these sorts of um, compilations of information for us. Now, here's one example, the so-called Philip Cross affair. He's one uh, anonymous English editor called Philip Cross. It may not be the person's name. It may not even be one person. That person apparently made over 150,000 Wikipedia edits in 15 years on every single day over five years between 2013 and 2018, mostly to denigrate anti-war advocates, or in many cases to denigrate anti-war advocates, including George Galloway, Craig Murray, uh, the whistleblowers from the UN's chemical weapons body and so on. Um, Wikipedia doesn't see any problem with that. That's something that exists. It's a normal thing in the course of compiling um, Wikipedia entries. So there's some references there to an article from Media Lens, which talks about that particular problem. Facebook, similarly, uh, one of the new media monopolies um, to sit alongside the other private media monopolies. These media monopolies can present an illusion of independence and or participation. So in many respects, they're as bad or worse than state media because they have this uh, verisimilitude of being independent in some sort of way. But it's become more apparent, I suppose, in recent years with the large scale censorship in uh, social media, I suppose, in particular with the exclusion of a sitting US President Donald Trump from his Twitter account, for example, that the power that these media monopolies and social media monopolies exercise is huge. But it's increasingly a US American view of the world, despite the fact that they disqualified a sitting US President. Uh, Twitter did, blocking information and views friendly to China, Russia, Iran, Cuba, Venezuela, Syria, and so on, or the, the two dozen or more countries that are sanctioned unilaterally under US law. And when there was a big wave of censorship in the early 2020, after uh, the US under the orders of President Donald Trump had murdered the key national hero of Iran and the key national hero of Iraq, in fighting ISIS in those countries. Uh, General Qasem Soleimani, for example, those who were posting um, uh, information about the funeral and the mourning for those heroes uh, 
their accounts were censored or blocked or they were excluded for or banned for a month or more, for example. And Facebook issued a message after that saying, to comply with US sanctions, we remove accounts maintained by or on behalf of a sanctioned party, as well as to remove content posted by others that support or represent the sanctioned group or individual. So that was the rationale for banning accounts or banning content that was supportive of slain Iranian General Qasem Soleimani. That of course means that it could apply to uh, people posting favorable content on any one of those countries I've cited in the bottom left of this graphic here from the Balkans, Belarus, Burundi, Central African Republic, China, Cuba, and so on and on. In other words, Facebook has reinforced its uh, character as a US American view of the world and actively engaging in, ex in excluding um, views that are different or in some cases opposed. Here is Twitter's guidance on how they have been branding what they call state affiliated media. And in the bottom row, you can see RT, CGTN, New China, in other words, uh, state backed official media in Russia and China all branded as Russia state affiliated media, China state affiliated media, but Voice of America, BBC News, ABC News, all representing state backed media in the US, in Britain and Australia, don't have any such tag there. So you can see there's a the partisan nature of Twitter's guidance here. Finally, self appointed fact checkers are near useless because really what do they represent anyway? They have appointed themselves. Usually they have some covert backing, uh, could be corporate, could be state media backing. They've got their interests uh, only to the extent that they might cite some additional evidence that we might like to look up for ourselves. We can't regard them as anything different to any other sort of corporate media, basically. Now, in the example below, we've got the European Union using its own official fact checker to reinforce its foreign policy position. Um, observe the self-serving statement rule that I mentioned before. Really, we can't take this seriously as independent evidence. The example I give is that Russia phobia is, this is a myth, disinformation. Russia phobia is the reason for deteriorated relations between Russia and the West. They said, no, actually relations between the European Union uh, have deteriorated due to Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea. Crimea. Now, following the coup in, in Ukraine in 2014. And their slogans are, don't be deceived, question even more. This is about disinformation. This is one of the most transparent forms of, this is you know official truth, believe us, because we are helping you question even more. In fact, it's simply restating a foreign policy position of the European Union. So researchers have to justify their own arguments and use of sources. This is just another official state media, this EU versus info, basically. And most of those independent fact checkers are paid by powerful corporations, foundations, or states which have their own interests. For example, Snopes in the US, which started off saying it was a family business, it gets its fund from Facebook and other US corporations. So we can't regard them as anything other really than another form of corporate media uh, which might provide a source of information which we should consider, but we shouldn't give it any particular status as an actual fact checker. Finally, here's some further readings you might like to follow up on.